We are in a series where we are um, talking about the better life. We're looking at particular passages from Scripture that show us what this better life is all about. Um, Passages that actually include the word better. Um, Last week, uh, we learned that better is, well, I was going to say the verse, but um, I know all of you memorized it. So now's your time to shine. If you were with us last week, if you picked up a bookmark, if you were working at memorizing just the first part of this verse, would you say it with me? Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And we learned that it is better. One day in God's courts, one day in God's presence is better than any other life. We often think that, well, life will be better when I'm in college, when I graduate from college, when I get married, when we have children, when I get the perfect job. I have always believed that life begins when I retire. I've wanted to be retired since I was a kid. I'm I'm getting closer, but I've always wanted to be retired. I just thought that would be the better life. And the reality is that life is better when we understand that we are living in the constant awareness of God's presence around us. That's when life is better, when we can experience God's power and God's peace and God's presence in every season. Today, we're going to look at another, um, another lie. I mean, the, the world tells us always that life is better when we have, you know, when, when we enter into another stage or another season, life is always better kind of into the future. Today, we're going to look at another lie that is so ingrained in us. It, it shapes just about everything that we think, everything that we do. And the lie is this, if one is good, then two is better, right? We all think this way. If one is good, then two is better. If one car is good, then two cars are better. Maybe it's an extra car for when our car has a flat tire. This week, I started driving to work and thump, 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 literally got two houses away, got out of my car. There's this flat tire. Honestly, yeah, a a second car would have been helpful then, but we always think maybe if it was a sports car, life would be better. Maybe if it was an all-terrain vehicle that we could take on vacations and, you know, thrill ride through the the wilds of Pennsylvania, life would be better. But we think, well, if one car is good, then two cars is better. If one house is good, two houses is better, especially if that second house could be a cottage on the beach Not Fort Myers, but maybe somewhere else or a cabin in the woods or maybe an apartment in the city, whatever we would desire for vacation kind of time. If one is good, two is better. If playing one sport is good, what do we tell our kids? Hey, you excel at everything. If one sport is good, then playing two sports has got to be better. One in, playing one instrument is good, then playing two instruments is better. If we have one dollar, it's good. If we have two dollars, it's better. This lie goes back all the way to the beginning. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. They had every tree that they could eat from, except for one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, you can have everything and it's good. And then the serpent comes to Adam and Eve and basically says, you know, all this is good. One more tree, one more fruit of that tree. Life will be better. And so they ate and life wasn't better. But we believe that lie. If one is good, then two is better. During the fall, there is a debate that goes on every year. And people can be very passionate about this debate. Um, It it consumes many people in many different ways. And it has nothing to do with the election coming up. It has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with candy corn. So... What's funny is I had this bowl in my office on Friday and one person walked in and said, and the other person said, yum. (laughs) And that's the debate. Do you like candy corn? Can you not stand candy corn? 
Is it even really candy? And here's what I want to know. Why did someone think that we needed candy to look like a kernel of corn? Why did someone think that? We don't have candy that looks like peas, green beans, broccoli, or cauliflower. So why corn? And someone will probably Google that and share that with me this week because I did not um, look at that. But I'm just going to do a quick survey here. If you like candy corn, don't be afraid to raise your hand. You like anyone like candy corn? Okay. Now, if you can't stand this stuff, raise your hand. Okay. We're, 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 we're like, you know, a third, two thirds, a little, I mean, it's pretty even there. There's no debate. You either like it or you don't like it. And I'm going to be honest. I like it. Always liked it. Why? Because it's just sugar. And maybe wax. I don't know what holds it together. Here's the thing. Here's the thing with candy corn. One handful of candy corn is good. You know, you, you, you can eat it all. And this past week, I tried this experiment at home. <laughs> One handful of candy corn is good. And then I decided I would have another handful or maybe a little bit more, I don't remember. <laughs> but when I'd finished that, all that waxy sugar stuff just sat in my stomach and I didn't feel so good. So here's this thing, one handful is good, but two isn't always better. If you remember nothing else from today's message, every time you look at a bag of candy corn, I want you to remember, while one is good, two is not always better. But that's the lie the world tells us, that if one is good, then two is better. But here's the truth. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does matter. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does matter. And here's our scripture for today. It comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls plus and a chasing after the wind. Better is one handful with tranquility than two two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. I hope it's still up there. Can you say that with me? Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with a chasing after the wind. I always forget the toil. Why is one handful better? Why is more not always the best? I want to just show you. If I have one handful, then my other hand is free. That means I can reach out to someone who's in need. Maybe I can encourage someone and lift them up. I have one handful to hold someone's hand in love as they're going through a difficult time. I have one hand that I can worship and praise God. I have one hand that I can open and welcome someone into my life, welcome someone into my heart, welcome someone into the life of the church. If I have one hand open, I can love God. I can love others. I can serve the world. I can share my faith and invite people to Jesus. With one open hand, I can do all those things that make life better. All those things that help us grow closer to God. You know, as followers of Jesus here at Faith Church, we talk about um, three relationships. We wanna be like Jesus. Jesus had a relationship with God the Father. Jesus had a relationship with the church, he formed the church, the disciples. He had a relationship with the world. He reached out to the world. See, if we have one hand free, then we can grow in our relationship with God 
through worship and praise and prayer. If we have one hand free, we can grow in our relationship with the church as we encourage people, as we love people, as we invite people into faith. If we have one hand free, we can serve in the world. We can bless the world. We can care for them. With one hand free, we can grow in the relationships. We can grow in the rhythms of life. And if you want to learn about those rhythms and those relationships again, I encourage you, invite you to be part of the Grow Workshop that starts next week. But if we have one hand open, we can grow in all that. If we have two handfuls, I can't do anything but hold on to the two handfuls. Can't really help someone. I can't serve them. I can't really worship God. I can't do the things that make life better. All I can do, all I can do is hold on to what's in my hand. Two handful, it doesn't always make life better better. Jesus warned his followers that more is not always better. It's not a better way of life. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. More isn't always better. And then Jesus went on and he told a story about a man who um, was rich in the things of this world. He had an abundant harvest. He had so much corn, probably not candy. He had so much corn, so much produce, so much grain that his, his silos couldn't hold it all. So he tore down his barns and he built bigger ones. You see, more is always better. And then he said, you know, I have all of this. I can take life easy. I can rest and eat and drink and be merry. But after he had more, after he built a second barn or bigger barns, God said, said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? He spent all that time making himself rich and wasn't rich in the things of God. He trusted in what his two hands could hold on to. And he wasn't able to grow in a relationship with God, in a relationship that with the people of God where he could encourage and love and bless them. He wasn't able to grow in a life of service because he was so focused on what he had and what he thought would bring him the better life. He allowed what he held to literally hold him, hold him back. And that's what Jesus warns us about. Don't let what you have have you. Don't let what you own own you. Don't let what you hold on to hold on to you. Hold on instead to what really matters. It's a tough question. What really matters to you? If you went into the doctors and they said, you know, or we're, we're sorry to tell you this, but you have maybe a month to live. When you walk out of the room, will you set different priorities? What will be important to you? How will you live your life in the next 30 days? What really matters? As we've been listening to stories coming out of Florida, South Carolina, you know, storm damaged area. What we're hearing from a lot of people is that while everything's been taken away, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, I still have my family. We're going to rebuild because this is an important community. I've, I read a, a, a post by a pastor whose home was destroyed. They were writing about how everything had been taken away, but they still had God. 
They still had a community of faith, a family of faith that would see them through. What really matters to you? And here's the thing. I, I really don't want this to be a rhetorical question. I, I want to invite you and encourage you to think about it and to answer it. If you're, if you're the kind of person who takes notes uh, during the message, you know, write down what is it that is ultimately important to you? What really matters to you? Go home, write it down, talk to your spouse, talk to your family, ask on your social media pages, what really matters to you and see what people say. I asked my Bible study on Wednesday night, what ultimately matters to you? And after kind of a period of silence, and I said, no, I'm really asking you. It's not rhetorical. Not one person, not one person said, well, you know, my house is really important to me. My pension fund, my bank account, my IRA is really important to me. Not one person said, well, my new car is really important to me. Not one person. What they said was, my family is ultimately the most important. My spouse, my children, my grandchildren. Almost to a person, it was, it was our loved ones that's important. I, I hope our relationship with God is what's important because God's the one who gives us everything. So our faith, our, our family, are those things ultimately in most important to us? And if they are, here's my question. As we're holding on to everything else in the world, do we have an empty hand to focus on those things? Do we have an empty hand to care for our family, to grow in our relationships? Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. So how do we live a one handful way of life? We begin to hear maybe how to do that from the Apostle Paul. This is from Hebrews chapter 12. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us throw off. If we're holding on to too much, if we have two handfuls, then let us throw off one handful. How can we throw off one handful? Here are three ways. We can cut back, we can throw out, we can turn off. We can cut back. We can throw out and we can turn off what really doesn't matter. Can we cut back? I'm not sure where you might need to cut back in life. Most people probably need to cut back in two areas, spending and schedules. We need to cut back in how much we spend because we spend too much thinking that more stuff is going to make us happy. But then the problem is all of that stuff seems to grab hold of us. And then sometimes the stuff isn't enough. And then we have to get more stuff because our stuff isn't new or our stuff isn't trendy. And so the more we hold on to our stuff, the more stuff we have to hold on to. That is a chasing after the wind because there's always going to be a new fashion. There's always going to be new technology. There's always going to be a new trend. We're always going to have to buy something more. But if we can begin to cut back on how much we spend, then maybe we realize our stuff isn't all that important. Do I really need this new thing? Is my life really better without it? Some people need to cut back on their schedules because they didn't put into practice what we learned last month which is that we can't handle it all. I thought about juggling, and then I figured if I juggled candy corn, it would just look like a mess, so. We can't handle it all, and yet we tell ourselves we can, and so we fill up our schedules. And so instead of cutting back like we heard last month, we do still think we can handle it all, and our kids can handle it all, and our families can handle it all. And so we put in more and more and more, thinking that it's going to make life better. If one sport is good for our kids, then two sports is better, and three is going to be better yet, because maybe one of them, they're going to get the scholarship if one job is good and the income from that is good, then two jobs is going to be better. Three jobs will be, be the best. I can get the most money. And yet we're chasing after the things of this world and forgetting what's really important. 
what's holding too many of us back. So we don't have any free time to focus on what's ultimately important. And we're spending so much that we have no margins of peace and tranquility in our lives because we just have to keep getting more. So we need to cut back. Maybe what we need to do is literally throw out. I heard a great phrase this week, throw away as if your life depends on it because it does. Does our life really depend on throwing out stuff? Maybe it does. Because if we're not willing to throw out our stuff, then our stuff is holding on to us. Just like the man in Jesus' story, all of his stuff was so important that he just went out and built bigger barns so he could keep it all. And what do we do? We just put it all in bigger closets. And then when those closets are full, we put it in bigger attics and bigger basements. And then when they're full, we put them in bigger garages. And then when they're full, we go out and buy and rent a, a you know, storage unit so we can put it in that. We're just like that man. Maybe our life does depend on the ability to, to downsize. Not long ago, I realized that um, without having children, um, all of my stuff is, will go to my nieces and nephews, who I can tell you 100% don't want any of it. <laughs> and I suddenly realized, am I really going to carry all of this stuff with me throughout my life? I had a very different perspective on my stuff, and I thought, maybe I can begin to downsize now. So I began to go through my things and I thought, who might want this? Who might be blessed by this? What can, I, what can I give away to bless someone else? If I haven't worn these clothes in a year, kind of what they say, if I haven't worn them in a year, maybe someone else would wear them. Maybe someone else needs them. Winter's coming up. Maybe someone needs all the sweaters that I'm not going to wear again this year. Can we bless others? Can we can we throw out? I'll never forget when Bishop Yambasu, the Bishop of Sierra Leone, uh, visited us and he was, uh, spent the night um, overnight in the parsonage with me. And as we were driving into um, my garage, he was talking about our garages, you know, that we have a garage and most people don't park their car in a garage, he said, because they're so full of stuff and they don't even know what's in the boxes that are in their garages. And he said, I'm just amazed by that because most of my pastors, again, he was the bishop of the area, because most of my pastors don't have two pairs of shoes. And he said that, and I'm looking around my garage, says, thank you, God, that I don't have a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> Not that my house wasn't full of it, and my closets weren't full of stuff, but at least my garage was somewhat empty. And I was like, but you know that really struck me. We have so much stuff, and there are people who have so little can we throw out as if our life depends on it? Can we donate? Can we bless others? Can we just buy less? Cutting back and throwing out are part of it. Maybe what we need to do is turn off. What do you need to turn off in your life so that you can have some tranquility? You know, better is one hand with tranquility. What do you need to turn off to have life a little more peaceful? You see, it's not just about holding on with two hands. It's also about what we fill our two ears with. And can we like turn off some of the noise so that our life can be better? What do you need to turn off? TV? Cell phone? One of our social media accounts? Now, I know I'm going to be stepping on toes here. Maybe what you need to turn off is CNN or Fox News. Because all they're doing is filling our ears. And maybe to turn it off and have some tranquility can make our life better. Think, literally, think how tranquil it might be if we turned off some of the noise around us. Maybe that's needed so that we can tune into the presence of God. And what did we learn last week? Better is one day in your courts, God, than a thousand elsewhere. A better life is going to be found when I can start listening to and hearing the voice of God. So what do we need to turn off? 
Cutting back, throwing out, and turning off can all help us let go of what doesn't matter. That's only half It's only half the battle. The other battle is this. Are we willing to fight for what does matter? Go back and think about those things that you you maybe wrote down or thought of earlier. Those things that are important. Those things that are ultimately important. Do you have that in your mind? Are you willing to fight for that? Are you willing to fight for what matters? When the people of Israel returned to Jerusalem, they had spent um, a generation or more in captivity. They returned to Jerusalem, and one of the first things they did was they built the walls. And as they were building the walls for security, for, for protection, the people got weary. They were growing tired. And the enemy was just waiting. The enemy was just waiting, thinking, you know, if they stop building, if they give up, we're just going to go in and take over. And Nehemiah, the one who is leading the people, Nehemiah understands what's going on. He sees the enemy out there waiting. He sees his own people getting tired. And so this is what he says. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. I know you're getting tired. I know you're feeling weary. I know you think there's no end. But fight for what matters. Can that be our battle cry today? Are we willing to go home and fight? I mean, really fight for what matters? I mean, not fight others, but fight the tendency in ourselves to not prioritize perhaps our family or our faith, our community. Fight for what matters. Now, here's the thing. I don't know what matters most for you. I don't know how you prioritize your list. I can't tell you how you need to fight, but I'm guessing that right now, most of you know exactly what the fight looks like. You know what it looks like for you to fight for your sons and your daughters. You know what it looks like to fight for your children and your grandchildren. You know what that means for you. It's making sure that they're a priority in your life and not just on a list. And you know what that fight looks like. Maybe you know what it looks like to fight for your marriage. It means that love, your love needs to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things. 1 Corinthians 13, that's the kind of love. Or a love that's willing to be the first to forgive. Love that's going to be willing to be the first to serve and not wait to be served. Fighting for our marriages means maybe getting the help we need to make it through instead of just saying, you know what, I'm going to give up. People on the wall, they were getting weary and they were getting tired. And when they gave up, the enemy was right there to come in. Are we willing to fight for marriages and say, I'm not going to give up and let the enemy come in. I'm going to fight for what ultimately matters. What does it mean to look like for you to fight for your faith? I don't know what it means for you, but maybe fighting for your faith means hearing what God really does say to you and about you, that you're forgiven, you're loved, you're honored, you're important. Maybe maybe hearing that message and believing that message is what it means for you to fight for your faith. Maybe it's acknowledging God's presence in your life. Maybe it's understanding that it is better to live in the presence of God than to live anywhere else. Maybe it means taking the time to communicate with a God who loves us, with a God who's given so much for us. Maybe it means I'm finally going to learn about these three relationships that were so important to Jesus that he made them a priority. I want them to be important to me. I'm going to make them a priority. Maybe it's that I'm finally going to start fighting to serve and love God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. I'm finally going to make that a priority. Can we let go of what doesn't matter and not just hold on to, but fight for what does matter. Better is one hand with tranquility 
than two hands with toil and a chasing after the wind. I hope you will learn, repeat, memorize, and live this verse. Will you say it with me? Better is one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and a chasing after the wind. Let us pray. Almighty God, in so many ways, we buy into the lie that if one is good, then two is better. And so we hold on to the things of this world as if our lives depend on holding on to them when actually our life might depend on letting them go. So God, I pray that we would learn this week how to let go of what doesn't matter. And God, help us prioritize in our own lives what does matter. Family, friends, our faith, our health. Let us hold on to that. More importantly, God, let us fight for that. Because we're in a battle to fight for what ultimately matters so that we can experience the better life, the life that you have for us. God, teach us that it's better to have less of what doesn't matter so that we can have more of you and more of what you teach us does matter. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.